Thank you for that very warm welcome. I'm really honoured to be here. Um, I need to start off by making it very clear that I'm not a health professional. I just was appalled at the ripe old age of 30 when I found out the child mortality rates in less developed countries and decided to try and do something about it. I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes. I was hoping we'd have time for questions afterwards. We may not, but I pledge, I pledge to answer every single question I receive by email and every single question that has the word Cola Life in it that comes over Twitter. So if we don't have time at the end for face-to-face -face questions, please put your questions to me by email and via Twitter. My email address will come up at the end of the presentation. Okay, Cola Life. Cola Life is uh, an entity, it's a UK charity. It has no paid employees. It has five voluntary trustees on its board and its focus is on saving children's lives. It is totally independent. It doesn't receive funding from Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, or any other of the 200 cola brands there are in the world. Our only project is in Zambia, but we are looking to have a global impact through disruptive innovation, thinking outside the box, generating robust evidence that even the most skeptical strategist in child health can have faith in, and sharing our findings widely and giving all the learning and knowledge away. I have no commercial interest, and nor does my wife, in the product I'm about to explain to you. I want to acknowledge the two other members of the Cola Life team. There's Jane, my wife there. Uh, we work together full-time in Zambia. In fact, she's working double-time at the moment because I'm here. And we have Rohit, our public health advisor, who's part-time, and he's based out of Toronto in Canada. And he uh, is doing his doctorate in public health at Johns Hopkins University and designed the trial I'm going to explain to you. As Joran said, this is where we started back in 1985 when I was bouncing around in northeast Zambia um, uh, trying to decide where roads and bridges needed to go and became very, very aware of the high child mortality and also the fact that I could get a Coca-Cola virtually wherever I went. And this is where we get our name from. Child mortality in less developed countries is unacceptably high. Back in 1985, on average, 20% of children didn't make it to their fifth birthday. Uh, now it's one in eight. So still more than 10% die before they get to five. But the public sector struggles to get essential medicines to public health facilities consistently all the time. Yet, as I said, you can get a Coca-Cola in most places. So if you can get a Coca-Cola in most places, why don't we simply put the medicine in the Coca-Cola crates? These are our um, anti-diarrhea kits, we call them. They fit snugly between the Coca-Cola bottles and they contain the WHO UNICEF recommendation for a diarrhea treatment kit, which is ORS and zinc, and we've put soap in the top so we can have a device for conveying the um, prevention message as well. The ideas are fine, and you can have the best idea you think, and you can sit in your bedroom and polish up that idea till you think it's perfect, but an idea is nothing until it's shared. Now, back in 1985, the only mechanism for sharing ideas that I had at my, my fingertips was one of these. A lot of you won't even know what this is. Um, it's actually a telex machine. And telex machines, let me tell you, are not mass communication devices. They're not collaboration devices. And the whole idea sort of was stalled in its tracks because I couldn't share it with other people. And then, uh, nearly 20 years later, uh, Gordon Brown, who was our Prime Minister at the time, this was before the credit crunch, um, he um, started this initiative, the Business Call to Action, where he challenged multinationals, he challenged big businesses um, to state what they were going to do to relieve poverty in Africa. And 
Many of the multinationals have signed up to this, including Coca-Cola. And it was this that um, got me started again. I did some research on the internet, which I can now do, and I found that nobody had this crazy idea of putting medicine in Coca-Cola crates, so I called Coca-Cola. And it was just like 1985. I got absolutely nowhere. So I set up a Facebook group and uh, with quite a sort of um, easy, achievable target. Let's talk to Coca-Cola about saving the world's children. Let me say at this point, we would be nowhere without Facebook. As soon as we had 100 people on this Facebook group, the BBC got interested in what we were doing. The BBC called me in for an interview, and of course, with their clout and their contacts, they called in the global head of stakeholder relations of Coca-Cola too. And that's where our, um, our relationship with Coca-Cola started. Uh, social media, particularly Facebook, gave us the power we needed to engage the big players that we have to engage to do what you wanted to do. At this time, with a Facebook group going, I had a proper job. Um, and so did my wife. Uh, and all this was being done on a sort of, you know, in the evenings and at weekends. And this report came out. This is from WHO in UNICEF in 2009. They were trying to reinvigorate the whole debate about diarrhea and what can be done to, 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 to solve this problem. Um, it made the point that we know what to do. Uh, we've known for 10 years at least that we need to get ORS and zinc to children with diarrhea. Uh, it's been the policy of Zambia to do so for the last five years. It's suggested in this report that every new mother should be given a diarrhea treatment kit consisting of ORS and zinc and given it at the birth of their child and, and explained uh, to them how, how to use it when, not if, but when their child got diarrhea. It talked about the need for strengthened distribution systems, the need for different delivery strategies, and it also made the point that market-based solutions are often the most effective way to deliver diarrhea control commodities. This became our Bible. This gave us the policy context for everything we wanted to do. Jane and I were sat around our table at the beginning of 2010. The Facebook group had been going for nearly 18 months. We had 8,000 people on it by then, uh, all egging us on. There were some people who were very against what we were doing, not very many, uh, because they would not work with Coca-Cola on principle. Um, but nobody said it was an idea that shouldn't be worth testing. And we realized, in sort of a cold sweat, that we were in great danger at that point of going down as these people who created all this excitement and then did absolutely nothing about it. So we decided in June to give up our day jobs and give us, uh, ourselves a year to see if we could get something happening on the ground somewhere in Africa. And this is a typical day you see in front of you here. That's our kitchen table in the UK. That's Rohit in Canada on Skype. And this is UNICEF and Harvard on the speakerphone. Our web presence was so big that we had expertise coming to us, people coming to us to talk about what we were doing. Uh, Rohit's voice was coming out that laptop, going into the speakerphone. The people from Harvard were being broadcast out the speakerphone into the laptop. And this is the sort of thing we did to, to bring people together. Lots of very nice things happened in that year. Uh, two of our supporters and myself cycled from Boulogne to Biarritz, diagonally across France, to raise £6,000. And that £6,000 paid for three trips to Zambia to engage with local stakeholders there and see how this idea might be tried and tested in Zambia. We were very prepared to be shown the door after our first visit, but we weren't shown the door. In fact, we got in to see everyone we wanted to see, right up to a director in the Ministry of Health, and this was just two people. Um, after, it took about a year, we had put this partnership together and we had a trial plan. This is this partnership, what we call an unlikely alliance. It didn't just fall together. 
If you look, you'll see you've got the biggest brewer or the second biggest brewer on the planet in S.A.B. Miller in the same uh, partnership as the United Nations uh, Foundation for, for Children. We had to do some hard negotiations to make that happen, but credit to UNICEF, they did enter into the partnership. There are organizations that wouldn't, on principle, work with um, private sector organizations like Coca-Cola and S.A.B. Miller, and that is misguided in my view. A few months later, we had the full funding package in place too. Uh, the UK aid agency uh, was, became the majority funder, uh, but special credit here needs to be given to Johnson & Johnson, who committed $250,000 on the basis of our plan with no strings attached. And we were able to use that money uh, to lever the other partners into place. In December, 20, in December 2011, the, the uh, trial got started, and this is the timeline. It was a two-year project with nine months of setup, 12 months of trial, and then the, the original plan was then to spend a, uh, uh, three, three months um, writing things up. In the, base, in the setup period, we did lots of really important things. We did the baseline survey, but we also listened to mothers. And I'll come to back to that in a moment. That's been a real theme of this conference and it's been absolutely crucial to the work that we've done. This is what we set out to do in the trial. We set out to see if we could increase the use of ORS and zinc, the WHO UNICEF recommended treatment, in the home treatment of diarrhea. To do that, we had to improve access to ORS and zinc. Uh, access to one of our kits, one of our anti-diarrhea kits. And by access, we meant the kit, ORS and zinc, in the hands of a mother or caregiver who knew what to do with it. And to do that, we had to increase the availability of ORS and zinc in these communities. And by that, we mean our kit for sale on the shelf in a rural shop. And caregivers need to know, needed to know what it was and how to use it. In the setup phase, we spoke to our customers. We spoke to women about the issues they face when they're trying to treat diarrhea in the home. We did eight of these focus groups, and we learned so much. The first thing we learned is that the litre sachets that were given to these women were too big. A child, on average, will drink 400 mils of ORS in a day. And if you follow the instructions on a litre sachet of ORS, you're supposed to throw it away after a day. So you make up the litre, you give 400 mils to the child, and you throw 600 mils away. Now, that's a waste of ORS, but it's also a waste of safe water. If you've had to walk two kilometres for that water, and you've had to boil it to make it safe, you don't want to be throwing it away. The other issue they told us about was measuring. That even if they did get the litre sachets, they didn't have a mechanism for measuring a litre. Um, so that was a problem too. We also learned about their willingness to pay for a, a kit of the sort that we were uh, proposing to them. And they also told us about what branding and how they want it to look. And this is what we came up with. It's a funny shape because it fits in Coca-Cola crates. It's attractive. It's desirable. It's even an aspirational sort of product. The sachets are not litre sachets. They're 200 mil sachets. We actually decided to go from litre to 200 mil during that setup phase. We were going to put litre sachets in just like everybody else had done in the past. The packaging is the measure for the water. It's a mixing device, and it's, uh, it's even a cup. This is for the academics amongst you. Uh, this is the design of our trial. It was a, a quasi-experimental trial with pre of a pre- and post-test design. As you can tell, I don't really understand what that means. Um, but basically, I think it means we did a baseline, we measured everything before we did anything, and we measured everything after we'd done it. And we actually did a bit of measuring in between as well, halfway through at a midline survey. 
We worked in four districts. Uh, two districts we intervened in, we made the kit available in, and two districts we didn't. Uh, our target groups for these surveys were carers of under five children and private sector community retailers. Um, we did 625 household surveys in each district, and we um, included about 40 retailers in, in the surveys in each district as well. This is to give you some idea of the scale of the whole operation. We had a private sector local pharmaceutical company who made those 200 mil sachets for us within a few months, which is amazing. Um, they also assembled the kits for us um, and brought in the components from overseas. We used the parastatal distributor of um, essential medicines, Medical Stores Limited, who already go from Lusaka to the district towns on behalf of the government. We paid them. They wanted to become more private sector. We paid them to do the same for us, except that when they got to the district, they didn't put the kits into the public sector. They dropped them at the Coca-Cola wholesalers. And then we trained about 85 retailers across the two districts in the danger signs of diarrhea, in the benefits of the kit, uh, so that they, be, they could, could become retailers of the kit. So what did we achieve in 12 months? Bear in mind that when we started, nobody knew what Kit Yamoyo was. Bear in mind also that we were only working in remote rural areas. We weren't working in the district towns, only in the remote rural areas. And we sold in 12 months 26,000 kits to about 85 retailers. Before we started the trial, less than 1% of children were receiving the recommended treatment for diarrhea, ORS and zinc. Even though that recommendation has been in place for a decade at international level and for five years at national level in Zambia. After 12 months, when we asked mothers if their child had, had diarrhea in the last two weeks, and they said yes, and then we asked them how they treated it, 45% of them had used one of our kits. In these areas, the only um, source of ORS was the public health centre. There was no ORS in the private sector at all, except through our kits. And we reduced the distance from the house to ORS from 7.3 kilometres, which was the average distance of the health centre, to 2.4. So we reduced that distance by two-thirds. 93% of the women who used our, or the caregivers who used our kit, uh, mixed the ORS correctly. Whereas only 60% of them did when they got a litre sachet. Now if you believe that you haven't delivered a medicine until the patient has consumed it correctly, then this is a massive finding. Before we did anything, the perception of the effectiveness of ORS as a diarrhoea treatment was high. It was 78%, but after 12 months, it was even higher, 92%. So in the trial districts, at the end of the trial, 92% of women thought that ORS was an effective treatment for diarrhea, before 78% did. And we think that's a combination of various things, but primarily because they're mixing the ORS correctly, and it's combined with zinc. This was a bit of a surprise and, and um, gave us a bit of a communications problem. Only 4% of retailers put the kits in crates. So that fantastic image of the kits in the crates was totally irrelevant. And as, as I said, gave us a bit of a communication problem. So this was our vision. This is what actually happened. When we created demand in those communities through community-based marketing, the retailer just came to the wholesalers and bought kits by the box for. They didn't put it in Coca-Cola crates. Despite that, that image of those kits in the crates has really caught people's imagination, and we've won so many awards. We won Product Design of the Award 2013. We beat the Olympic Cauldron. We beat a, beat, a, a pair of Nike trainers. Uh, we won the Ethical Product of the Year last year. We won the top packaging award at the DuPont Packaging Awards in the States. 
In September last year, we were featured at the United Nations General Assembly as a breakthrough innovation in child health. And last month, we were featured um, in Washington, D.C. as one of the best buys for global health. Now, our strategy for impact is that other people pick up these results. Cola Life cannot grow quickly enough to have the impact that we need to have. And anyway, it's not our job. It's the job of national governments, international donors, local NGOs within a country who are already there to take these results and improve their strategies. One of the key channels for the dissemination of these results will be peer-reviewed journals, but we uh, are also making it available to people immediately if they are working in the areas of, of, of health and, and, and uh, child health. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. So what are we doing now? We've done the trial, and we're going to national scale. Oh, we've gone to national scale up. We've only just started, but there was no gap between the trial and the and the scale up. But everything is under review. There's no point in doing a trial if you don't learn from it. The first thing is ORS. This was the this is the number of um, sachets that women used of the ORS. And as you can see, 80% of women use four sachets or less, and 10% used eight. Now, that temp those 10% used eight because there were eight sachets in the kit. They didn't really need to use eight. So you, from that, you can say 90% of people only needed four sachets. Four sachets times 200 mil is 800 mil. So why are we giving two liter sachets to women to treat diarrhea in their homes? Obviously, halving the number of sachets in the kit um, halves the price of the ORS. And as affordability is so crucial, we have to do everything we can to get the cost down. So this not only gets the cost down, it also increases adherence, because if there's no ORS left over, then the next child that gets um, diarrhea will, go and, will have an, a kit of its own, and will have its own zinc to go with it. This is the adherence to zinc. We've got about 33% adherence to the 10-day regime. But as you can see, two-thirds of women or caregivers followed the diarrheal episode. Now, we've had a massive impact on the adherence to ORS through design. What, can we do the same thing with zinc? Well, we have an opportunity to do so because our local pharmaceutical partner in Zambia has been inspired by this project to manufacture its own zinc. There was no zinc in Zambia uh, before our trial, when our trial started. If we're producing zinc locally, we can design the packaging ourselves. So we're looking at this sort of design to see if we can get that zinc adherence up from 30% to something a bit higher. Soap. There's only one manufacturer of soap in Zambia, and we persuaded them to produce a 30-gram bar of soap. Uh, and that is the one that will go into our kits that will reduce the cost of the soap. The leaflet in this kit is quite complicated. It's in three languages. It's multifolded. We can make it much simpler um, uh, so that the front will look like this and carry the branding. The back will look like this and explain how to use zinc. Uh, and the center fold will explain how to use the packaging to measure the water and mix the ORS correctly. And finally, to the packaging. This award-winning packaging. This thing that's captured the world's imagination. Well, we're chucking that out, too. Because it's expensive. And it doesn't need to fit in Coca-Cola crates. So we're going to a locally produced um, a container based on the jam jar. So we will be producing two formats. Uh, this is the, uh, what we're calling the screw top. Uh, it works just like the other one did. It's got the same contents, as I've explained already. The contents come out. It's got a much clearer measuring mark than the original container had. You just fill it to the line. You take one of the 200 mil sachets. You can do this in the dark, by the way, which most people have to do. But if it's not dark, it's good that the child is watching at this point because they get excited. They think this is magic. You put the lid back on. Whoop. 
This is actually a 3D print, so it's a bit thicker than the, 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 the final version will be, so it doesn't seal quite so well as it should. But there you have 200 mils of perfectly mixed ORS with a cover which stops dirt getting in, flies getting in, and so on, uh, and the kid can drink from it. Cheers. But cost is everything. So we're also looking at this format. It's a flexible, we call it the flexi pack. It's a gusseted bag, very, very cheap to produce. It's got a laser cut in the top, so you can open it without destroying the bag. You just pull it. In fact, let me just see if you can hear it. Um, you take the contents out. You pour water in to the mark. As you get to 100 grams of water, the bottom pops out. And so even this flexible pack can uh, provide um, the measuring device for the water. So what does the scale up look like? Well, it's, everything is based on community-based marketing, getting that demand going in, 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 the, in communities. Now, this is going to be led by a partnership of local NGOs um, in the, the markets that are of, are of no commercial interest at the moment. They will be in the future, hopefully, but not at the moment. Our commercial partner will be doing the same thing in commercial markets. Um, places in peri urban and peri-urban areas where people have cash all the year round. And then we're collaborating with other people like um, Mary Stopes, for example, who have community-based distributors, and they are incorporating this product into the, the things that they sell door-to-door -door in, in remote communities. And they tend to be working in the markets that won't be of immediate interest to, to the commercial sector. And then on top of all that, we've got a mechanism for capturing all the learning and sharing that as we go. We've learned so much from the trial, we're going to learn, or we are learning so much from the uh, scale-up as well, and we want to share that as well. Another part of our strategy is to be open and to share what we uh, um, to share what we're learning. Uh, if you go to that, that URL, you can um, apply to get access to, to the information before it comes out in peer-reviewed journals. So what do we learn from Coca-Cola? I've shown you this picture before, but let me explain to you what we learned. What we learned was, well, first thing, when you go to a rural community and you find that Coca-Cola there, you don't see any Coca-Cola trucks. Coca-Cola doesn't distribute to small rural communities. What it does is it creates a brand, it creates a value, it creates a desire for its product. It creates value in the communities where the, the product gets to. And that impacts, that means mothers go to retailers and demand the product. Retailers go to wholesalers and demand the product. Wholesalers go to the manufacturers and say, we want more product. So the value goes up from the customer or the patient to where the product is produced. And that pulls the product into communities. And that is the reverse of what normally happens in the, in the, in the public sector. Normally in the public sector, you assess need and you push stuff to, 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 to patients. This is the opposite. So that's one thing we've learned. And if you're into tweet, Twitter mode, that's how you explain it in 40 characters. We've also learned about marketing. Um, I will concede at this point that I think Coca-Cola have the edge on us here. <laughs> but there are some common features here. The brand is very, the product is very prominent. The brand is there. There's happiness and joy and beauty um, in, in, in the promotion of the product. I want to just finish with two things. One, this request of you. If you only do one thing after this presentation, please can you go to Facebook, facebook.com slash colalive, and click the like button. That may sound a very trivial thing for me to, to ask you to do, but that's where we get our power. So please do that. I've gone through the quasi-experimental blah, 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 and the percentages and so on, but I just wanted to bring the whole thing alive for you a bit by showing you a very short clip of a conversation with Gladys Imasiku, who is in charge of one of the health centers 
in the trial area, and then we'll have questions if we have time. Hey, so just, just tell me your name. Don't look at the camera. <laughs> I'm Gladys. Gladys. And your ah, okay. And your son is a is a re, is a retailer, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, okay. And do, has he got has he got um kits in the store now in his shop now? He has uh, opened a new kit today. Ah, okay. And you what a new the bag? The one finished in the morning, then he later came to open the other one. Ah, okay. Yes. So um we were talking about diarrhea cases in the clinic here. Yes. How have they changed? Have they changed at all since the kit came in? Yes, they, they changed. Eh? Because before the kit came in, people you, we used to have a lot of diarrhea cases. Sometimes even if we give the ORS we have, they will come back again to be reattended to on the same case. But this time, since the kit of Yamoyo came, there's a very big change. Once we refer the patient to the shop there, when she will buy, she will go. She will go for good. She won't come with the same case again. She will come with a different case if that's where she will be seen. So why do you think that is? Ah, it's a very good project. Because it, has, <laughs> it has improved the health of the people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you think it's because maybe the kit has, has zinc in it as well? Or? <laughs> Yes, I think even, even the kit itself, or to combine with the zinc, it is doing a good thing to the community. Mm. Yes, because here we used to give the our rice, we don't have any zinc. So mm. they used to come back again. So mm. this time when they are getting those kits with the zinc, at least there's a great change. Mm. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Simon, Simon, I wish I had your energy, your <laughs> natural power for this. And using the resources this way, they are not new resources. You just reuse the things we already have. I love that. It's fantastic how you have worked in all different knowledge levels all the time. I think the, the key, I mean, there's been a key theme of this conference has been listening. And in fact, all of the things I've been talking about are already there. It, you know, there haven't been, uh, we haven't needed to create anything. We've just needed to put things together in a different way. And uh, so, I haven't had to have any public health knowledge, really. I haven't had to any, have any logistics knowledge or any retail knowledge. I've just observed that next to these health centers with empty shelves, literally next door to them, there are shops with full shelves. And you just put all this stuff together. We know how to do this stuff. Certainly across sectors we do. If we collaborate between the public sector and the private sector, the public sector can do things the private sector can't do, and vice versa. And if we get together, then we can do amazing things. You are fantastic, Simon. Thank you for coming. <laughs>